Welcome to Halftime, a show dedicated to equipping and inspiring people to accomplish what God has prepared them for. I'm Doug Piper, and I'm a Halftime alumni, and actually these webinars are part of my Halftime journey. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Halftime is focused on helping you create more meaning, joy, and impact in your life. So if you're feeling a bit that way, or maybe you know someone that's in that season, you can find out more by going to halftime.org. That's H-A-L-F-T-I-M-E dot O-R-G. And I'll also include all that information again at the end of the program. Now, today we're discussing a Princeton professor's wisdom for engaging your adult kids. All right, we got everybody on screen successfully. So today we have Lloyd Reeb and halftime alumni, Dr. David Miller. David is the director of the Princeton University Faith and Work Initiative, which he founded in 2008. He spent 16 years in international business and finance at several financial senior executive positions before shifting to academia. As part of his halftime transition, he earned a Master of Divinity and a PhD in Social Ethics at Princeton, and then taught at the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. He's also written a fascinating book, God at Work, The History and Promise of Faith at the Work Movement. We also have Lloyd Reed. And Lloyd is a successful real estate developer author of three books and the founding partner of Halftime Institute. Welcome everyone. And I hope everyone is well. And David, thank you so much for joining us. How are things in New Jersey? Well, they're terrific. Uh, thanks, Doug. But I have to say the, um, the way you introduced me has me a little bit nervous when I've been called a wise guy a lot, but I don't know about having any wisdom. So, uh, <laughs> But and also full disclosure, Lloyd, I, I think you set me up here because I'm the last guy you should have asked to do this. I mean, full disclosure to uh, those listening to us, Chad, uh, Karen and I are not parents. So what do I know about parental wisdom? But we uh, we are doting and devoted aunts and uncles to uh, five nieces and five godchildren. Uh, and we chose to invest our lives uh, very dearly and deeply into theirs as part of our calling. Uh, and uh, so we've learned maybe one or two things from them. And Glad to share them, and I'll tell you a little bit later about some of the things my students have tipped me off on. To, and so and thank David, you. David, didn't you just uh, officiate at one of your niece's weddings? I, I did, I did, and it was extremely emotional. Uh, she's also a keen Princess Bride fan, if any of you know that cult movie. And she insisted that I that I open up the ceremony imitating uh, the the right honorable clergyman. So that was kind of fun. Saying marriage is what went on. Oh yeah. <laughs> You're you a know, good sport. Uh, David, I officiated at our daughter Carol, uh, Jenny's wedding, and uh, I made two mistakes, like I just did now. Uh, in it, one was just reading the, uh, you know, the vows for my son-in-law Chris, and Jenny goes, "Dad, you can ruin a perfectly good wedding." <laughs> but it was, it's a joy, isn't it, to be a part of a kid's um, special day? So. Thanks for joining us, David. You know, you and I have been on this journey in many different ways. Um, I can still picture you back at the Halftime Institute a long time ago. One of the funny things you told me was that after your long um, career investment banking, you went back and got a union card. <laughs> you know, you'd have to explain what that is. Yeah. In fact, I, I see you watching. I'll give a shout out to, to Karen Hung. Hello. Uh, she was one part of the great uh, participants in our Greenwich Leadership Forum uh, a few years back before she moved away. But yeah, in fact, she'll remember this. Uh, uh, so when I when I left the the investment banking and corporate finance world in London, I was a partner in a small boutique, uh, sort of a M and A private equity type firm, uh, and went to study theology. Uh, I quickly realized that first in the MDiv, and then I stayed on, much to my surprise, for a PhD in ethics. Essentially, just asking one question: What what does my Wall Street Journal have to do with the Bible is really what I was uh, curious about. And, uh, but I realized if I ever wanted to teach uh, or felt led to teach uh, at a university, you, you need the union card. If you don't have the PhD, those 
letters, which my friends all remind me just stands for pilot higher and deeper. Uh, you, you can't be at a faculty, you can't be in the faculty. So it's just one of life's ironies because obviously many professionals would be eminently qualified to uh, be faculty. But, but So I have the union card now and uh, uh, treasure and respect uh, those who have that as their calling, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, it's fantastic to have everybody here today. And I also appreciate everybody in the audience that has joined us. We have a bunch of folks there. And thank you so much for taking time on your evening to, to join us for this program. Uh, you can ask David questions uh, down at the bottom center of the screen. There is an ask a question link. If you click on that, you can type in there questions for David, which will be answered in the second half of our program. And your question will be answered whether you're actually there or not. So if you need to catch the first part and leave, you'll still get a unique email that takes you right to where your question was answered. Hey, Doug, Please. can I ask you a question? I've got a question. There's some people, I don't know if I want them to ask a question, like Robin's on this call from, from uh, Chicago, from Lake Forest. She's known me since college days and, and those of my deep checkered past. So, you know, a couple of people like that, Mimi also in Chicago, they know me all too well. So can, can you censor out a few people? Yeah, Doug, Doug will block those guys. Yeah, we'll block them or you can say, Doug, I'm not hearing you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, we also have a poll which is very, very important. We use this poll to guide our conversation. Uh, I will let you know, uh, David and Lloyd, kind of where we are so far. It doesn't tend to shift a lot, but I would encourage everybody to get in there because we will, David will drive his conversation in the rest of the program based on your input in this poll, because we want this program to be about what the audience needs to hear. So, so far in our question of what is the biggest challenge you face when it comes to engaging the young adults in your world around spiritual topics during the crisis, our majority of our audience is answering. They have been, um, they've been resistant to deeper conversations like this in the past. So there's a concern, David, on how, how we kind of break through that barrier um, that a lot of people, you know, are faced with when you're trying to bring up a, a difficult conversation like that. Mm -hmm. So we'll continue on. So we also want to hear where you're from in the chat. It's very active so far, and I appreciate everybody that's joined in the chat. We're anxious to hear. I see Jeshurun from Cary, North Carolina. That's not too far away and Lake Forest. So please share where you're from. It's just great to share where everybody is. So we have an idea of, of kind of where we're all coming from this evening. Now, Lloyd, you know, as, as I was preparing for tonight's event, uh, it, it was, I was kind of thinking, you know, here we are, we're nearly halfway through 2020, and, and it's one of the craziest years in my existence. Uh, we're, we're bound to our own homes. We have extremely limited real life social contact. Uh, nearly everything in our lives is uncertain. Our health, our jobs, savings, uh, relationships. Well, it, you know, it's hard not to focus on our own challenges during this time. But is there actually an opportunity that we have as halftimers to take the conversation deeper with the ones we love the most during this crisis? Yeah, you know, Doug, first of all, thanks for your partnership in doing these and thanks for your friendship. That's why I really wanted to get our friend David on um, this week because I spent all day every day talking to men and women who are in halftime in deep, intimate coaching conversations. And many of them have adult um, kids either home or stuck in their own apartments and homes, and they have more time on their hands. It's disrupted their world. For those who have college age kids at home, their internship opportunities are disappearing or, or, or less than they expected. And it, it's disappointing, it's disrupting, and it's a wonderful, unprecedented opportunity to not only be together and around the table at dinner, but 
also to potentially take the conversation deeper and begin to uh, use this opportunity to shape their worldview. And, and yet there's this temptation to just hunker down and um, play games and watch Netflix and go golfing, cook, cook a lot more meals together, go for long walks. And as I listen to the people I spend every day talking to, there are different challenges that they face when it comes to engaging their um, young adults in this conversation. And, and David, like I was telling you earlier, um, five years ago, I made a list of 10 young men that are the sons of my closest uh, friends. And I reach out to them every month. And these kids are uh, sort of between 20 and 35 or so, and they are all having their lives disrupted. So I thought that, Doug, this would be a great time for us to spend some time with with, with David. Now, David, you left banking on purpose, right? Uh, this well, is your well, intention. I, I, didn't really, I didn't really want to. Let's, let's be clear about that. I kind of liked what I did, and I was halfway good at it. But it was uh, truly one of those sense of God calling me. I mean, it wasn't like I got a, an email or a text, but it was a slow drip feed that took about 18 months. So I, I did go a little bit kicking and screaming. I, I love the corporate world and um, never thought I would go into academics. Yeah, and you still have some stuff in, in corporate world. I know that I read in the Wall Street Journal and uh, you and I went back and forth a bit. You're the kind of ethics um, resource for Citibank. But um, you, you, you mentioned that um, at the time, way back then, that you saw so many of the leaders in our world coming out of the Ivy League, you thought it was important to go back and, and be a part of grounding them in um, the, the historic documents of our country and Judeo-Christian principles. And so talk about what you've been doing first at Yale and, and now at Princeton for these last 17 years. Yeah, I mean, Princeton is really my, my love and my life now. I've been there uh, 12 years. It's just an extraordinary place. Uh, and, it, you know, it might, some of the Ivies might have a reputation of being um, uh, sort of elitist and old school and so forth, but it's extraordinary, the diversity uh, of thought, uh, of mindsets, of backgrounds. Uh, in my students that show up in class, they're, it's like a little mini United Nations uh, and people of all religious traditions. And I'm trying to legitimize as an intellectual proposition that faith is okay. Faith matters. In fact, I said to one of my colleagues that if we weren't talking at places like Princeton about the role of faith and work and faith in the marketplace, uh, whatever one's tradition, frankly, uh, we're, it, it's, it's intellectual malpractice that we need to be naming and thinking about this. And Princeton's really embraced it. It's uh, been an exciting, exciting journey. And the students, uh, uh, likewise, I, frankly, when I was in, in the college, I went to Bucknell. In fact, I see Scotty McDonald, another uh, Buck Nellian on the line here from Chicago. Another person who could tell a lot of bad stories about me. We played soccer together, or I should say against each other. We were rivals, uh, different fraternities. But, but uh, you know, I think people want to talk about this. The, the, new, the, the current generation, the Z generation, and the new and the millennials before them, they aren't afraid of this religion topic or spirituality or faith, whatever we call it. Call it. They're, they're hungry to have those conversations. And I don't think it was that way uh, when I was in college. So, you know, you've spent all these years and thousands of hours creating a safe place for young adults to, to really explore this journey uh, and shape a worldview. And, and um, along the way, you know, you've gotten feedback from them. You've learned things that have worked and not worked. And then even more importantly, in preparation for our time today, you took the initiative to go back out to them. And like you told me uh, earlier, the feedback has been amazing. You could you could basically write a book. So let's just take let's just take this time now and go deep into what what you've been learning uh, from from them that we can that we can learn from you. Yeah. So there's a couple of folks on the call I know the, on the webinar today from uh, my advisory board at the Princeton Faith and Work Initiative. I mean, really, on uh, Kevin Weiss. I see you popped in from uh, Arizona. And one of the things that we're trying to do with their help, we've just got a very wonderful, dedicated board, is we're trying to have people think the student, I'm trying to get the students to think about the great questions of life, the big questions of life, and to take, uh, you know, the old taboo, you don't talk about sex, religion, or politics at work. Uh, well, I think religion can and should be talked about appropriately, respectfully, of course, and in any domain. It's part of humanity. It's part of what makes people people. 
so I, I teach a class called Business Ethics and Modern Religious Thought. Like all titles, it's a very boring academic title. The students have nicknamed it over the years, How to Succeed Without Selling Your Soul. How to Succeed Without Selling Your Soul. And I have been blessed to have some of the most amazing, bright, curious, uh, hungry young men and women from all different traditions. So it's not just uh, Jewish and Christian traditions. I have Muslim students, I have Hindu students, Buddhists, atheists, uh, you name it. It's like just like the real world is, like our workplaces are. Uh, and and I have learned a lot from them, and, and, and I think they've learned a lot from each other. I, I, I get teased by them that it seems like two or three times in every lecture I'll say something like, uh, if you remember nothing else from this class, remember this, and then I'll have some aphorism that I'll throw out. And and uh, two of them are, are uh, don't go swimming in the deep end alone. And the second is, uh, uh, when in doubt, go to a trusted friend for counsel if you're in some ethical dilemma or situation. So taking my own advice, I, I, I've curated a list of, oh gosh, the better part of 80, 100 students that I've uh, kept in good touch with over the past 15 years or so. Uh, mostly they're uh, from my Princeton students. and. Uh, and I wrote a note to them and, and, and said, help, <laughs> if you were to be having my role tonight talking to this wonderful uh, group, what would you say to them about the very questions you asked me? And my gosh, I, I have over, here, I'll show you, I, I've got, I printed off this, like, I have 40 or 50 responses and I only gave them uh, like a day or two to respond and they're in the middle of exams right now <clears throat> or they're out working. They range from age 20 to 33. Uh, male, female, about the same. They represent a variety of industry sectors uh, and also a variety of religious stories. That uh, one of the things we made clear in the class is you didn't have to, you don't have to be religious to be in it, but you have to be respectful for those who are, and vice versa. Uh, in the, the racial ethnic mix is also very diverse, social economic mix and background. So it, it's just an extraordinary, extraordinary group. Uh, and they came back with, uh, I asked them to, I didn't lead the witness. So I did not say that the halftime group looks at these questions through the Judeo-Christian lens. Because I know also you'll have people go to halftime who, who may not be of that um, uh, place in their, their mind or their heart. So I, I kind of left it free format. But it was amazing how many people did bring up spirituality as something they'd love to talk with about their, to, to their parents. Yeah, so so take us, David, then inside that you're sitting in your space um, in your office at Princeton. Mm -hmm. um, a kid comes in, it's exploring uh, faith things. What are some of the ground, you know, what are some of the fundamental skills uh, that can help them, help you, help them uh, really explore faith at a deeper level and shape their world worldview and explore Jesus' claims even? Yeah. So, and again, the way I do it, I have to be, and I think this is appropriate. So I, I teach at a secular research university, although it has strong Presbyterian roots uh, and, and strong religious overt uh, foundations. It is a secular research university. So I, uh, it's not appropriate for me to make a case for what I believe. Uh, but, and I say to the students the very first day of class, I say, look, you can Google me. You can very quickly find out what I believe, uh, who I am. Uh, but if any of you think by by uh, playing up to that, I can smell a brown nose or a mile away and I'll flunk you. <laughs> but, but equally, if some of you have genuine heartfelt questions that you want to ask why I believe what I believe, or you just want to talk about your own journey and have a sort of an honest broker or fair, to listen to it, I'd be glad to do that. Under one condition, we, we do it the day after grades are in, because I don't want anyone to think I'm using my power in appropriate or asymmetric power. And that's just part of being at a secular research university, but I'm okay with that. I think that's fair. But the thing is, uh, Lloyd, how many students do afterwards come back and say, you know, can we talk about that prop? I mean, you mentioned such in class, or you assigned this reading. By the way, we tend to focus on the three uh, Abrahamic traditions in the class to look at classic texts and resources to say, what's Judaism say about ethics in the workplace and leadership? What's Christianity say about ethics in the workplace? Is there a difference between Catholicism and Protestantism? What does Islam have to say about it? Uh, and they're actually hungry to have these conversations. I think the minute they realize that you're, you've been true to who you are, even if they don't believe what you believe, the mere fact that you're being yourself, uh, that goes a long way. Then they feel free to be themselves and express their doubts. Or the, what about this? Or I don't buy that. Uh, and I, I suppose one of the things that I uh, will frequently respond on one of the Gospels, you'll uh, remember there's a uh, man, Jesus is about to heal his son. And and uh, the father says uh, to Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. 
and, and I'm the first to admit, here I am, I've got a PhD in theology and social ethics, I'm ordained pastor as it happens in the Presbyterian Church, and there's a lot of stuff I don't know yet. Uh, John Stott was my mentor when we lived in London, and, and he used to give these Saturday seminars, and he would say, oh, yes, when I was a young man, I didn't quite know the answer to that. But about three years ago, I think I figured it out. So I, I think it's okay to have both deep convictions as well as deep questions, and that's all right. Yeah, so that strikes me, David, as part of your skill at building a safe place um, for young adults to explore is to be be equipped to have done the heavy work of study, um, but at the same time to be a learner, co-learner alongside of them. It strikes yeah. me as I listen to you, it's as if, if, if you and I were sitting across the table from each other and you put a big, hairy, religious- yeah, that's right. Six feet. And then instead, what I hear you saying is that you get up and you move your chair all the way around beside them figuratively and then put the issues out on the table and uh, and look at them together in a, in a safe and um, unpressured way. So, Doug, let's take a second and see, you know, there are some common challenges that particularly parents and then adults who have nieces and nephews and um, friends around that that have are young adults that are, that are open to exploring deeper things and faith issues right now. So let's look at the poll and see uh, what stands out to folks. Lord, I want to go through and read the poll because I think it sets a lot of the tone for what David is going to be talking about today. So the question in the polls, if you haven't responded yet, even if you have and you want to change your answer, you can. <clears throat> what is the biggest challenge you face when it comes to engaging young, young adults in your world around spiritual topics during the crisis? The first answer, first choice is, I don't know how to open up the conversation. Second choice is, I'm concerned that I won't have good answers when it comes to some of the questions that they bring up. Third answer is they have been resistant to deeper conversations like this in the past. And I don't have the skills to lead the conversation without being dogmatic or heavy handed. And the last choice is I sense I need more resources to give them that, that I can extend their learning and discover after a brief open conversation. So let's look at the poll and actually see what is uh, leading in our questions. And this will help David kind of focus it. So uh, there's been a, a little bit of a shift. Uh, the, the leading answer is still, they've been resistant to deeper conversations like this in the past at about 40% of our audience, uh, which is the, the majority. Uh, but just below that at 30%, uh, I don't have the skills to lead the conversation without being dogmatic or heavy handed. So s almost 70% of our audience, you know, are resistant due to, or, or, or hesitant due to previous resistance. And they also feel unprepared, David. So, so yeah, a, a few thoughts as I'm kind of skimming over some of the, the notes that I um, extracted, so essentially verbatim, uh, from from the students, and tried to see what themes they had. Again, I remember there are some who would have been uh, graduating physically in their senior year. Uh, some are uh, rising seniors, and then others are 33 years old, married with kids, and uh, out in their professional life. So that's that's the spectrum. So some of them accented different things. Uh, and you know, maybe one thing that came out to me is. Uh, not to do a disservice to the directness of the question, but maybe sometimes that's not the right question to ask, uh, uh, of uh, the sole focus having a spiritual conversation. Maybe it's first, and this came out from, you know, who are you today and how, what sort of person are you becoming? Uh, tell me about yourself. Uh, what are, it could be a parent speaking, you know, what, what things scare you today? Uh, what things, what, what uncertainties do you have in your life? Do you worry about relationships? Do you worry about career is, do you think you'll ever uh, catch up? A lot of the research shows, and it echoed my students, that they, they kind of feel always behind, uh, that they're they're not going to catch up, and, and the virus is just one more thing that sets them back. So I, I'd, I'd widen the aperture and range of questions about what's going on in their life instead of uh, shrinking it just as one question, tell me about your spiritual well-being. 
I'd let that uh, evolve from the, the conversation. So that, that's one uh, strong uh, suggestion I, I'd make, let, let it flow, um, uh, as one of many things which constitutes their life and their hopes, joys, fears, concerns at the moment. Uh, the second thing is, and a few of them said this, it's kind of interesting, because uh, I, I framed it, I think one of the ways you described this is, is the half-timers. Um, I, I said, essentially, these are the people I'm talking to, they're your parents. They're all super successful. Most of them have been in some sort of professional life. Some have made a move into nonprofit sectors, but they're just wonderful people, super successful. So they're your parents. Uh, well, they pointed out to me that, well, some of them aren't, but some will not be my parents. They may not come from a background like that. They may come from a broken family or uh, first to go to college. So in terms of financial professional success, uh, they may have a different narrative. Uh, they, they also, showed, I thought, a wonderful maturity of saying, because I think the phrase used, Lloyd, was going from being an authority figure in a young child's life to being a guide later in their adult life. And it's nice language. But they kind of inverted that and said, well, you know, we're making this transition now where we think we might have something to offer our parents. Uh, and not in a cocky way or an arrogant way, uh, but but we think maybe we, we've, we have some things in our life that might help you, or at least we should talk about and share. Uh, one a woman, she even mentioned, uh, it's very moving, that her, um, uh, that as her parents were getting a little bit older, she was having to be more and be aware of being involved in their financial well-being and decisions about care. That suddenly, uh, there's that poem when the, the boy becomes the, the child becomes the father of the man, uh, is the line of the poem. So some of these, they're, they're facing questions about mortality, their own, which you tend not to think of when you're in your 20s as well as that of their parents, which you also tend not to think of. So they got you know, some big things going, but I, I love this uh, quiet mutuality they wanna have. And, and they're really interested to hear your stories. They don't wanna hear your propositions. They don't, probably don't want your advice as such. But they wanna hear your stories. Like mom, dad, you know, what was it like in the, uh, uh, when you were growing up? Did you ever have any major curveball thrown at you like the virus where your whole world was turned upside down or I'm sure you remember your parents talking about the depression when when everything was all bets were off. Like, how did you get through those times? Uh, what did you learn mom? What did you learn dad? Um, uh, some even want to say you know tell me about your marriage. Are, are you happy with it? Assuming it's still their first marriage or maybe their second or maybe they're single. Uh, uh, I'm kind of afraid to get married. I want to get married but I'm a little nervous. Uh, well, tell me some stories. So I, I think the more um, you could set an overture with your adult child that, uh, and maybe you're kind of direct, you say, you know, I, I, I've been thinking, I'm just so proud of you. I'm just so proud of all you've done. Gosh, you've gone to, and it doesn't have to be Princeton, wherever you've gone to school, I don't care, a community college. But, you know, you've gone, I'm really proud of you. And, and you know, I feel we've got a rare chance during this virus, or one, maybe a once in a lifetime chance for us to have more face time together. They might even be living back at home again or some the time. Um, I just love to, get to know you as a young man. I'd love to get to know you as a young woman. What's on your mind? What, what brings you joy? What scares the heck out of you? And, and just let it happen then. And I bet yeah. a lot of the, the and so I wouldn't worry about it. Maybe I've ducked the question, but I wouldn't worry about not feeling capable because we all know how to tell stories. We all have our memories. Some are painful stories. Some are great ones. And uh, let they'll probably guide the discussion for you if you ask the right questions. You know, David, it strikes me that um, um, just by asking tough questions ourself, it our kids are drawn into them. Uh, one every Christmas Eve, I I have a one question for the family, and so about four or five years ago, we were all sitting by the fire, and I asked them, "Okay, my question is, who do you think is going to have the most difficult time growing spiritually next year?" Mm -hmm. And I got up to get more popcorn or something, and Great I came question. back. They all said, Dad, we think it's you. And uh, I was like, <laughs> me? Like, how come I gonna, uh, why do you think, you know? And then like one kid. Why that man is you. <laughs> yeah. And so what I realized in them answering this was they were thinking about what does it take to grow spiritually, right? Yeah. And uh, one, one person said to me, well, Dad, people just assume you're walking with God. And, uh, and who is it that really challenges you? And she said, well, uh, the youngest girl, Jenny, she said, but dad, if you're going to grow, that means you're incrementally working at things that you know you need to grow in. You've been at this for a long time. It's going to be harder. So what I realized in that, to your point, in that one question, instead of coming out with a proposition, 
it was a question. And then just last, uh, we have a standing um, Skype call or uh, Zoom call with um, our daughter who's a missionary in France, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. And um, Linda said to me on the weekend, uh, Lloyd, what do you think is an area where you're selfish that you could grow? And so I said, ah, oh, man. And I was, I was thinking and humming. And she said, you can't think of anything? <laughs> I'll help you. <laughs> and so I said, well, if I could just right off the bat, I mean, don't you think I'd be working on it, honey? And so we talked back and forth. Well, then in a little bit later, we had this call with Carolyn. So I said, Carrie, mom asked me, where am I selfish? And she said, right off the bat, she said, I know, dad. You, you sometimes say mom talks over you. She interrupts you. And she said, I've been keeping track of it. And you interrupt her just as much as she interrupts you. <laughs> so isn't it great that, you know, when you take yeah. the, the fear factor down and just be open to be a co-learner? Um, oh, exactly. No, I mean, you, you, you're so right. And I think, uh, you know, out of the mouth of babe, out of the mouth of babes is the saying goes there, there are, uh, in some areas of life, some of these young adults will be wiser than we will as, as older adults. Uh, some might be deeper in their faith. They might have been like I was just stunned uh, um, uh, at, at coming to Princeton. The vibrant uh, uh, fellowship group, fellowship groups on campus, both Christian and, and non-Christian. I think there's like 20, 19 or twenty different Christian groups you could pick. There's two or three Jewish groups. I mean, and so the, the, being a person of faith as a student is is accepted, and, and a lot of them grow and mature in their faiths in ways that, that I certainly didn't have that ex exposure. Uh, I see, by the way, uh, Rick Thompson and Nancy have come in from Atlanta. Great to see you guys. Uh, uh, they're also old friends who we've reconnected with recently who can uh, uh, share great stories a lot, a lot better than I can, I'm sure, about what it's like to be parents with challenges. Uh, but but I, I would just go back to stories. I, I think that's the name of the game. And, and, and by telling those stories, I think it's also fine for parents to say, you know, one of the things that's important to me, you say, I, I don't know if this is important to you. We, we haven't really talked about it as a family, but, you know, my faith's a big thing to me. It's one of the big questions of life. And frankly, I'm, I, I'm I, you know, I don't have a MDiv. I'm, I'm not a pastor. I, I can't explain it well, but I just know it's really important. And I want you to know that. And I really want to invite you to, um, to th if it's not, is it on your radar screen? Yes or no. And if it's not, uh, the question of God is one of the biggest of life's questions. I mean, what yeah. are, who am I going to marry? What's my career going to be? But, you know, throughout all this is this, this question of God. And I think put out like that, uh, I think most of my students, even if they're devout atheists, they think that's a fair question. Uh, and it's what, it could be a lifelong question. But, but I think give them permission to think about it. So, Doug, we'll, we'll transition here because we're at the 30-minute mark um, to some questions. But actually, speaking of questions, David, you know this item here uh, that ranks second, I don't have the skill. Mm. Um, one of the things I found, uh, I, I don't know if you know this, David, but I was a pastor of evangelism for uh, five years. Yeah. Back, um, is that if you want to prepare, the skill to prepare is questions, good questions. A question like, um, you know, if God was on the phone, if you knew it was God, and he said he would answer one question, what would you ask him? Mm. I find that's a good good uh, opener. Yeah. And then, uh, and what would a second question be? And yeah. uh, not, to, not to have all the answers, but a good question. And then in terms of resources, one thing that that's, I find helpful is, is to find a, a, a uh, set of communicators like Tim Keller or Francis Chan, that have just a great way of communicating complex things in simple, short videos, and then you can watch them together and talk about it. Um, you know, your idea of questions, in fact, I, I even, um, I double down on your idea of asking like, what's the one question? I'd say, you know, what are some of the toughest questions you could think of? And if, if, if you don't, if you, if you don't describe yourself as believing in God or having faith, or you're kind of, but you're not sure, like what are the questions that are, are the roadblocks for you? And, and let's drop a list and let's work on them. Let's take this next year and, Maybe some I can help you with, Johnny or Sally. Uh, my guess is we're going to need to find some books and people who can help us have those conversations. And let's yeah. let's wrestle them because they're fair. I, I don't think, at least the guy that I believe in, I don't think he's afraid of hard questions. Uh, and well, you could find people to help you uh, get through. You don't have to have the answers. And, you know, it be, as you describe to me your role in these students' lives, what, what strikes me that's different from a parent, us as parents, is – that 
you you care about them, but you don't feel like you have to have all the answers. You're leading them on a journey. And sometimes I think as parents, we feel like if our kid asks a spiritual question, we got to have an airtight answer. And yeah. that might just be the worst thing that we do. It might be yeah. saying, hey, that's a really good question. I don't have a really good answer. Let me think about it and let's come back and, hey, can I take you to lunch and let's talk about that. And yeah. I'd love to hear what you discover. So, Doug, what are some of the questions that uh, we've got there in, uh, from our team, our group, our friends? All right. We've already got a couple of questions. It's not too late to get yours in. You can type them in while we're going through these. And also, we are very respectful of your time. And so if you only allocated about half an hour, we understand you can, you may need to go, but understand if you type your question in right quick, David promises to answer. I think you said most of them. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's assuming I have the answer. So, I, I mean, I have I got to practice what I preach, right? I'll, I'll, I'll give it my best shot. How's that? Okay. And if you so. don't have a question, everybody gets a vote. So if you see one in there you like that you want to make sure gets answered first, uh, you can go in there and use that. And several people have already voted these up. So our most popular question, David, is, and, and you've somewhat already answered this, uh, but I, I suspect there's more than one answer with a question like this. Do you think that the COVID crisis has created an unprecedented opportunity to share our faith? Assuming so, is there a way you found to intentionally allow the conversation to drift in a spiritual direction? Uh, you know, I, I don't know that it would, I mean, I think coming out of the Christian tradition as I do, and I think many people on this call, uh, I don't think we need an extraordinary event to do it. Uh, that might be a nudge, but I, I think it's business as usual. Uh, and that we meet people where they are, uh, our coworkers, our friends, our buddies, our pals, whether we're single or married. And I think we, we need to cultivate ways that it, that that conversation isn't some big hairy deal. It's just part of who we are, and it can find its way to pop into conversations on a on a regular basis. Uh, so so don't make it any harder than what it is. Yeah, you know, that's, that's maybe a nice way to put it. And and kind of this approach of, you know, there's a lot of things like they're trying to figure out, yeah, finances, careers, marriages, faith, God. And and maybe when you're younger, you, you kind of put them all on the same plane. You don't have a like a hierarchy of what ought to come first. That, that's fine. Um, and, you know, Lord, you just said a second before you go to the next question. Sorry, Lord, you said something a minute ago that made me think of this, that um, a few of the students said, you know, we love our parents. Our parents are amazing. But P.S., we've kind of figured out they're not perfect. <laughs> and, and we know they don't all have all the answers. We know their marriage isn't perfect or we know their work isn't perfect or we know, but we love them to death. Uh, and, and there's kind of this, one woman had this extraordinary uh, way of describing it. She said, you know, I'm independent. I have my circle of friends. I don't need my parents to be my babysitter anymore. I don't need them to tell me what to do. Uh, and then she flipped in the next paragraph said, but having said that, gosh, I'm almost going to cry when I say this. Gosh, I miss when mom would make me a cup of cocoa and tuck me into bed. Wow. So here's this really talented late 20 year old woman and a great professional, and, and she misses when her mom tucks her into bed. Yet she's going to make her own decisions. So, what may seem contradictory, so maybe remember with your children, they still want you to be mom and dad with unconditional love uh, and hug them and affirm them. Uh, but they still, you know, they're adults and they don't want too much uh, pushing in any particular direction. So, sorry, I digress, but Lloyd made me think of that, that, that they know. No, we're, David, that, we're that's, that's just really deep and rich, isn't it? That to, to just, to just come at it from a very humble perspective that, like you say, the kids already know that, you know, like Carrie looked at me and said, dad, I know right off the bat. And you're yeah. selfish. Uh, yeah. Carolyn, you know, I brought you into the world. I could take you out. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, but that's great. And then the next thing I know, like she misses being home cause she's stuck in an apartment in France. Right. And, and yeah. so they're open. And so to find out, you know, maybe one of the best things we can do, David is figure out their love language. You know, does this kid want a hug? Does this kid need quality time? Does this, and and then, then these deeper conversations emerge as we just choose to love them extravagantly. 
Yeah, because I think if we're only asking about the faith question, they're going to see it and they're going to feel played. Uh, yeah. I would too, frankly. But if we're saying, I just want to know who you are. Oh, gosh, you're beautiful. You're 27. I am so proud of you. Or you're 32 and you've done this and you're doing that. And boy, you're taking risks. And I've got one guy, who, terrific. Um, uh, I mean, he was one of my first students at Princeton. We have this very close relationship. And he's, I think he's, he was a religion, religious studies major. But he's now in his fifth uh, startup. And, and um, I, I'm just so proud that like, he has the courage. I didn't go through five startups. So he's, he's doing it. And, and I think parents could you have that conversation and everything else. Everything else just naturally flows from it. In fact, well, one student said, you know, like, how do you start these conversations? And a little bit, uh, Doug, of that question, part of it um, is, uh, is send them <laughs> send them the email that I – show the email I sent them to their parents and say, what do you think? <laughs> My prof sent me this. What, what you, here's what I told them. What do you think? And literally use that as your setup. So I, I suppose even those folks listening here, you could say, uh, we listened to – Crazy guy and and uh, uh, and got me thinking. Tommy, Sally, whatever their kids' names are. Um, I, I I don't know how to do this, but I, I really want to do it. Could you help me? And they might have a laugh about it, but it gets it going. Well, I, I love that answer because that gives a nice uh, that makes it kind of third party. Uh, you can you can both stand out and and point and say, okay, that's what I heard. What do you think? So that's. Very yeah. insightful. Yeah. I, I love your stories, David. They're they're very picturesque and very memorable. Well, thanks. Well, they're uh, these amazing uh, young adult stories. They've just given me the privilege of sharing them. So, so Doug, this is something that you and I are just hearing with, from David over and over again. Is this deep, authentic appreciation, awareness, and admiration for his students? And, and, and that's kind of the answer. The medium is kind of in the message, isn't it? It, it? The medium is the message here in some ways is to look these young adults in the eyes, like my list of 10 that I reach out to every, every mm -hmm. month and just really learn to love them, admire them, pray for them. And then with their best interests at heart, be willing to explore all kinds of topics, their health, their careers, their finances, and their relationship with God. By the way, finances is something that came up a lot, and, and, and not in a kind of a yuppie sense, but uh, one person shared uh, very privately about concerns about some of her parents' financial decisions uh, and how it's going to change uh, that they made when the not stock market had some disruptions recently, how it's going to change things for them. And, and, uh, and, and, and I think they wanted to talk about money. Money is one of those taboo topics. Uh, should they have a budget? Uh, Mom, Dad, did you have a budget when you were starting? Uh, uh, did you stretch with your first house, or did you did you buy a used car or a new car? Uh, you know that those things aren't taught anymore anywhere. So so I think money would be a great topic to. Uh, and, and even if as parents you're not proud and you just kind of winged it and you got away with it, maybe say that too. Uh, kind of these they were all saying things like, "What would you have done differently, Mom, Dad, if you were thinking about this? If you had a duo or if you had a mulligans." Um, what would you do different in your marriage? Uh, uh, what would you do different in your work? Uh, and then, you know, obviously, what would you do different in your faith? You know, I, I've met a lot of uh, adults who say, I, I wish I had started thinking about faith and work, uh, and my faith life, and how it ought to impact my work, to view my work as a calling, to think about ethics and uh, and meaning and purpose in my work. I, I wish I had thought, started thinking about that when I was 22 and not waiting until I was 42. Like a lot of the folks come to halftime. They've bifurcated those worlds. Everything's been hunky-dory until they have some sort of crisis, uh, and they realize it's not about climbing to the top of the ladder because you get to the top and say, gee, is, is that all there is? Uh, it's, it's finding uh, significance in your success, and I would argue uh, having a faith foundation is a big, a big part of that because it, it gives you sense. In fact, that also came out as a theme of the student's perspective. Give me perspective. One student even reminded me of... Um, C.S. Lewis uh, wrote 81 years ago. C.S. Lewis wrote uh, 1939, uh, just as you know, World War II uh, was coming. And he, he, he gave a sermon called Learning in Wartime, Learning in Wartime. And he reminded me of it. And I, I reread it briefly. There's a couple articles you could see in some different magazines on it. You could find the Internet that he said. And I think it's relevant to our time. He said, during a time of crisis, OK, we're in one now. He said, you have three enemies. People of faith have three enemies. The first was he called excitement. Um, uh, or, or sort of distraction, sort of getting overworked and emotional about everything and not uh, listening. And let's face it, we, we get 
five different experts in a room about the virus and we're five different opinions. That's even before we get into the politics of it. So, so, so one issue is excitement or distraction and that paralyzes us. Uh, the second thing uh, Lewis said was, um, uh, the second enemy was uh, frustration. We just get frustrated and, and that can impact our careers and so forth because life sooner or later will we'll get through the whatever the it is. The war will be over, the virus will become containable at some point and there'll be a, a vaccine. So we can, through frustration, make bad decisions. Uh, uh, and, and so we talked about these things. And, and in fact, one of my students, independent of that, talked about, this was actually two said two different things. One said she was worried about um, inaction through distraction. And then she wrote, ooh, that rhymes, I like that. So I, I need to give her a footnote so she gets full academic credit, but, but inaction, uh, uh, through distraction, in other words, too much time in social media, uh, too much time procrastinating, um, as opposed to sort of taking this rare moment of time that most of us have. We may not have the hour and a half commute we used to have, but what am I doing to do differently in an hour and a half? Am, am I reading a novel I never had a chance to? Um, am I calling up grandma and said, remind me again who's in my family tree? Who was your grandma and great great? And going to mom and dad say, you know, can, can we talk about some stuff? We've, we've kind of always danced around these things. I just love to hear you tell me some stories about where I came from. Uh, so this distraction, um, uh, uh, inaction through distraction, kind of a paralysis, one, and Lewis was making the same point, C.S. Lewis. The other, another student said, almost the opposite, said that I am just so busy <laughs> and, I'm, and the day ends and I don't know where it's gone. Uh, and probably a lot of us could say that too as type A people on this, on this, uh, this webinar. Uh, so, so between these polarities of inaction through distraction and, and over busyness, there's some middle space. And, and I'd argue and that that's a place where parents can say, maybe our faith can help adjudicate that because faith reminds us to find quiet time. Faith reminds us to prayer, think about prayer and, and to pray. Faith reminds us to think of those, the, 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 the least of these, the, the, you know, the widow, the orphan, the, the, the alien, the, the person who's sick or scared or disabled. Um, and needs love and care to think outside of ourselves. Uh, a couple of the students playfully said, yeah, I know, we're the millennials. All we do is think about ourselves and we're the snowflake generation. We don't have grit, we don't have guts. Well, they do, they do. Uh, and, and, but I think faith could be one of the tools in their toolkit. And that's all a parent needs to say. Well, we'll move on to our next question uh, from Sir. And Sir asks, two of my sons are heading to medical school. And it's a long journey ahead of us. They're strong in the Lord and have a relationship with the Lord. How do we bring up and openly discuss time, uh, discuss lifetime decisions like dating and marriage without imposing our views on them? Uh, well, you know, maybe this is a variation of something I said earlier. Is, is maybe sit down with those sons, whether it's together or whatever would work in kind of a, a relaxed uh, uh, setting and say, you know, I, I want to bring up a big topic. Uh, hope, do you mind? Just hopefully they'll say no. And then say, look, I, I don't want to tell you how to run your life. Um, uh, you've got to figure that out yourself. But but I really, I really want to talk to you about how you're going to figure out, assuming you want to get married, how are you going to do that? Uh, I'd love to hear your, your thought process. Is it random? Um, is it, do you have a, a list? Uh, if you're open to it, I'd be glad to give you my reaction and tell you some of the things that I thought about or didn't and I wish I had when I was, when I was younger. And so I'd, I'd kind of be blunt uh, in, a, in, a gent in a gentle way, uh, as it were, uh, and ask if they're open to the conversation. And, and you could even say, look, I, I feel awkward saying this, so I don't quite know how to do it, but just bear with me. I'm, I just got stuff in my heart. I want to listen to what you say. And, share my reactions. And frankly, I wish I could have a couple do-overs or whatever. So David, it sounds like it's, it's really always permission-based and in coming from a lear uh, fellow learner perspective without ducking the fact that we've had more experience, we've had more time to learn. And maybe uh, for some of us, we've had more time to really be taught by the spirit of God. Uh, and, you know, there will be times that, like, so I, I'm not saying that you don't have to have a backbone or you have to stifle what you believe. I mean, there will be times uh, that one student sent me a clip reminding me from one of the uh, um, Rocky Balboa stories where uh, it's when he's later and he's trying to come back into the ring. And there's this sort of three or four minute segment 
where um, uh, his, his son is like really ripping into him and saying, dad, you're embarrassing me and so forth. And, um, and, uh, and Rocky has this really amazing speech that he gives his son and said, you know, I used to, you were just my whole life. I remember I could hold you in my hand. And I've been so proud of you. And he said, but at some point, something went wrong and you're different now. <laughs> he kind of exhorts him to say, be the, be the young man you were, but were becoming somewhere you went off a little bit to the side and says, find that man, because that man is amazing. He's not me, he's you. Uh, so I think there's a time as a, as a parent or as an aunt or as an uncle, Karen and I have had a couple of those conversations now and then with our beloved nieces or godchildren to say, hey, you know, you got to step up here. Um, I can't fix it for you. I don't want to, you don't want me to, but you got an issue going on. And I think this issue is going to prevent your life from flourishing. So while I'm certainly accenting this sort of uh, uh, permission, as you put it, um, there, there's a time to put your cards on the table. Carefully. In a, in a humble way, it sounds like. <laughs> Carefully, and not every time, but there's a time when the big conversation has, has, has a degree of intensity to it. A great question. Uh, we have, we're, they're rolling in here pretty good, David. <laughs> so we're going to have to try and rip through them. Uh, we've got eight questions. I'll try to be more succinct. I get all excited when I think of my students. And gosh, they, they gave me all these... Like, I wish you could just read all this. My goodness, it's just so rich. Go ahead. All right. So uh, your friend Mike has the next question. Uh-oh. So, so Mike David, Lee. <laughs> oh, David there are all sort of purported facts, statistics on the dis decreased interest in religion at college campuses today. What is your sense, and say if you... What could you compare Princeton today versus your experiences at Bucknell? Yeah, um, it's a little bit apples and oranges just because of the years. Not so much the institutions are different. You know, they're both Northeastern uh, private liberal arts schools. So in that regard, there's a, a lot of similarity. Um, but the, but the question is the word religion, and there's a lot of people who are kind of fed up with religion, and I confess I'm one of those at times because it'd be misused and it uh, sounds sometimes rather ossified and not very inviting. Uh, but as John Stott uh, said it in one of his books in his opening to it, I think it was in um, uh, a Basic Christianity, he said, uh, and this was written in the 1950s, 1958, he, he was traveling all around college campuses talking about faith to, to uh, audio, audio, auditorium full rooms of very bright students. And uh, he said, you know, I heard a lot of people really be upset with religion, and frankly, I agree with them. Uh, I've heard a lot of people be upset with Christianity, and frankly, I understand that. But I've never heard anybody be upset with Jesus. So let's talk about Jesus. And, you know, it's kind of an interesting way to uh, separate out even our own pastor who married Karen and me uh, 40 years ago. He, uh, I once came back from Bucknell, my big hobby horse of why religion's all screwed up, and so forth. And I thought I would get this really strong defense because he was a pretty traditional conservative guy. And he said, well, you're right, David. I said, what? He said, and, then it, and I'll never forget that. He said, David, please never confuse the church with Jesus Christ. Just don't confuse the two. The church is a fallen entity. Jesus is not. Focus on the prize, then work backwards. And like, oh, I get it. <laughs> so I was a little slow. It took me a while to figure that out. But uh, there's a couple of people like Charles that made the difference in my life. Yeah, but you remembered it. Oh, gosh, like yesterday. Mm. Uh, Mike, that was a great question. Uh, Thanks, we Mike. Had, we've got a couple more here. And it looks like Karen has our next most popular question. David, can you say more about the intellectual malpractice? <laughs> when there's malpractice, one can conceptualize that there's usually some form of insurance to guard against it drastic missteps and to mitigate high risk. What would you perceive as the risk, the missteps in the insurance? Gosh, what a terrific question, Karen. And, and I know your background that you uh, know everything about sophisticated financial instruments and hedges and risk and so forth. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think if, if, when I say intellectual malpractice, and I'm, I'm intentionally being provocative, but what I'm trying to say is if we don't talk about the big questions of life, if we don't talk about the kind of things we're talking about, this, this phone call, I think we're doing a disservice to our students. Uh, uh, and there are ways that are appropriate and not heavy handed in a classroom, even in a research university to have these conversations and to not raise it 
to these questions is not giving our, our, our amazing young men and women a good education. So what's the insurance there to back? So if the, if the university, whatever, ABC University doesn't do this, um, uh, well, gosh, then it falls to mom, dad, aunts, uncles, grandparents, uh, friends, coworkers, buddies, pals, teammates to pick up the conversation and then to find amazing literature. And there's so many good books out today. You mentioned Tim Keller and there's so many others uh, where there could be thoughtful conversations uh, about um, about faith. Uh, so hopefully there won't be any lawsuits. Yeah, and David, so so two things there that I want to highlight. One is, is, um, is for you and I to look around and take responsibility for people around us that we love. And one of the best things that happened um, when, when Linda challenged me, uh, I asked myself the question, as I told you, what's the most loving thing I can do for my closest friends? They don't need anything. They're all fairly wealthy. So mm. I decided the most significant gift I could give them is to love their kids and take an interest in their boys. Mm. And just sticking an appointment on my calendar for 90 minutes every month and listing their 10 names has given me not only when I come to that calendar appointment is the time available, but their names are there. So I can just look down them and think, okay, here's Chad. What's up with him? And here's Christopher and here's, you know, Michael. And, and so before long in 90 minutes, I can reach out to every kid. That's 90 minutes a month. But I tell you five years later, it's made a huge oh, difference in our lives. That's extraordinary. That's extraordinary. I think that's just terrific. Really. And the benefits, I mean, you would never do it for this, but now I got 10 really cool dude friends that when I'm like <laughs> 75 and boring, <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously, I mean, one kid plays golf for LSU. I mean, it's one of the best golf teams in the country, right? <laughs> and, uh, and they're doing the coolest things. Well, so the way God works it is when you take responsibility for the people you love around you, you will get multipliers back, right? And I'm not oh, yeah. trying to up on them. One of the things Bob said about faith is he, Bob Buford said about faith is he, he said, I never power up on my friends, but when they ask me questions about my faith, I never duck. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that seems like such a authentic, winsome way to, yeah. um, to talk yeah. about it. Yeah. Hey, as a quick aside, and, and you're right on that. I see uh, Bonnie has uh, found the quote, the exact quote for us, uh, what John Stott said in the, um, in that book, he said, quote, she got the quote, thanks, uh, Bonnie, and basic Christianity. I've never heard anyone be upset with Jesus, so let's talk about him. <laughs> so, oh, and by the way, you know, if you get in those conversations about the um, uh, uh, the problems with the institution of the church and Christianity, which are valid and fair conversations, uh, I also, in different, oh, in some conversation, I'll point out, show me one institution that doesn't have hypocrisy or problems. U.S. government, yep. We got our problems. Um, World Health Organization, CDC, uh, a museum, the academy. Kind of go through the list. Hospitals. I mean, they all. Have, they, everyone has institutional issues. There's a, a massive. Been doing some project on uh, trust, looking at how faith can help uh, bring a restoration of trust. I gave a was invited to give a paper over at Davos on that. That and, and people are interested. That how do you, how do we restore trust? And and I think uh, for people of faith, that's that's part of the question that because trust institutions is so, so harmed now. All right. We've got time for about one more question. Uh, so I'm going to look through these. Uh, I, I think there's a, a really good one here uh, from Jeshron. And, and I think you can relate to this one, uh, David, and I certainly can as a uh, parent of a prodigal. As a parent, it is difficult to see our children make poor choices hmm. when they don't want to take our advice, even though we've learned from some really poor choices that we've made in our own lives. So how do we engage them? Yeah, you know, I'd uh, always try to find, um, I'd set up the conversation, not like surprise them over cereal at breakfast or something i'd say hey can we find time later this weekend i want to take a walk with you there's stuff that's on my mind nothing negative i just want to talk to you about stuff uh can we set a time it's essential time to do that and they may say well fine let's talk now okay be ready and then say just what you said in that question to me you know as i look back i've, I've made some poor choices and i regret them uh 
And it just pains me when I, I see you make some poor choices. And I know you're better than that. And I know, you know, some, it just, it happens, right? We don't always make right choices, but, but there are a couple I know you could have avoided. And golly, can we talk about that? Because I just believe in you so much. And if, if there's any way I can help you think through these in the future, I'm there for you. Not in judgment, but just consider me part of your backup team. Something like that. Well, thank you, David. I appreciate all those uh, learned questions. And Karen says, thank you for being provocative about that. <laughs> You know, one last thing, David, that came to mind as you were talking about that is when Carter turned 18, we did a celebration, a manhood celebration with him, um, like what the Raising a Modern Day Night book talks about, you know. Right. And uh, I brought three of my closest friends. Uh, we went put, put it on a golf course and then went to one friend and cooked these big monster steaks. And my friends gave him a sword that said a real man lives for a purpose bigger than himself. And uh, But at the end of the night, they gave him a little card, a little business card, plasticized. And on the front, it said Carter's personal board of directors and, and mm -hmm. each of their names and their cell phone numbers. And they said to him, look, there are going to be times when you've got questions about life, about your faith, and you don't want to talk to your dad for some reason. You can call us anytime. That's great. And That's great. Thought, wow, what a great backup, you know. I mean, couldn't <laughs> buy them. And maybe that's another idea is to engage the people that also love your kids and have known them since they were little. And yeah. so, David, thank you for your time. And I got one last question. Tell us about all those beautiful pictures behind you. <laughs> so this is our, our wall. We're actually not in Princeton right now. The way our lockdown work, all faculty were sent home. We have a place in Key Biscayne, Florida, and that's where I am now. Karen um, uh, did this. There are 741 photos on this. It's 19 columns, I think, by 39 um, uh, rows uh, or vice versa. Uh, and they're a mixture of the saints who have gone before us, uh, our family uh, still alive, and friends. Uh, and it was, uh, they're all black and white uh, where they were all color, we digitized them, then we turned them from color into black and white. They're all four by four, and they're, they're imprinted on the back of glass. So it's not a glass frame, but they're, it's embedded in the glass. And, and you know, as, as I've been talking, I hadn't quite put this together before, but as we've been visiting that, um, another thing you could say, if, if which I've done is when, when our nieces or others have asked questions or my students ask questions where I, I don't know what to say or whatever, See, that, that's that's your saints there. That that's who you you find in your life. That you say, you know, Tommy, Sally, I, I I don't know if I can answer, but you ought to talk to Uncle Bob. You know, he's really good at this stuff, or he might be able to help you. Or you remember my buddy? He's, we play tennis. You ought to talk to Tom about this because you know, he's thought a lot about this. Or or uh, you know, the, tap into those people, and and I bet your your children will be thrilled to do that. So there's the. Uh, we call it Rogues Gallery, but I suppose I should be nicer and call it the uh, the Saints of Gunma for us and who walk alongside us still. Yeah, oh, that's sweet, David. Thank you so much for your time and your friendship and and your sacrifice and leaving a big career and following your calling to invest in our kids' lives in in those prominent schools. And by the way, you might have some water on that table behind yeah, you. Yeah, I know. It's uh, it, 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 well, yeah, we'll figure it out. It's just water. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, but I want to thank you. Both. I think what halftime does is terrific. Uh, Lloyd, we've known each other for years, and uh, I thank you for that friendship uh, and just the terrific work you do. And a shout out to all the folks who, uh, who are watching today who also encouraged me in the, the years of the journey Karen and I are on. And indeed, it's Karen and I. I could not do what I do without her uh, love and support. Mm. Yeah, Linda says it sounds like there's more good stories back behind you there. So <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> then there'll be an opportunity for another live stream. And and I want to yeah. thank the audience. We've, we've had such a huge crowd tonight. We thank you for your time, but it is the top of the hour. So we do respect you there. We know there's a lot of questions that were unanswered and maybe David can help us uh, type in some answers there to those questions. Yeah, we'll try yeah. to those answers. We're frozen here. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. You know what? Maybe what I'll do is that I kind of came up with a top 10 list of things, sort of themes or topics. Some have to do with faith, some have nothing to do. Maybe I'll put together a little tiny uh, outline of things just to think about. Uh, uh, yeah. But I think we'll we've about the, the core things are just uh, be yourselves, tell stories, 
share your, your flaws and warts as well as your celebrations and joys. That would be awesome. Thank you, David. So our next live stream will be May 28th at 9.30 a.m. Uh, this is Eastern time and our topic is building your second half net network. Uh, Lloyd, thank you so much for hosting us again and organizing this. Uh, and we, again, the webinar is recorded. A link will be sent out to everyone that's registered. It's actually the same link that you use to watch it, but feel free to share that out for people who would enjoy it. Uh, so again, we thank you, everybody. David, thank you so much for your time and preparation for this evening. Lloyd, thank you. And to the audience, we just thank you so much for your time. Bye-bye. Thank you.